Okay, so now that we've talked about partial observability, at least at the level of um, seeing how we can recognize states, or at least estimate some distribution over the under underlying states, then let's use that in the context of reinforcement learning. So for this set of slides, we're going to talk about essentially partially observable reinforcement learning. And, and then here, uh, this is uh, fairly general because now um, if we go back to our original picture of how do we model in an abstract fashion the whole problem of reinforcement learning, now we do not make the assumption anymore that the environment provides us with states. We're just saying that the environment is going to provide us with some observations. And then those observations might be incomplete, might be noisy, right? And, and then it's OK. We're going to develop some algorithms now that will uh, work with this weaker type of signal. OK, so let's go back to Markov decision processes. This was the foundation for us when, when we talked about reinforcement learning. And then if you recall, in that context, um, so we had states. Uh, that was the key component for us to decide which action we would select next. And then uh, the action then would influence the next state and, and so on. OK, so now if we have partial observability, what happens is that we still have states. The, the difference, though, is that now the states are hidden. Uh, so we cannot make decisions based on the states. But instead, we're going to receive some observations. And those observations are going to be correlated. So this arc indicates that there's a correlation between an observation and a state. Um, and then it's, it's the case at, like this at, at every time step. OK. Um, now, when we make decisions, um, when we choose our actions, it's, what we could do is always just choose an action based on the last observation. But if that observation is incomplete or if that observation is noisy, then at some level, you know, it might not be optimal, right? So before, when we talked about just fully observable Markov decision processes, we could select an action just based on the last state because with the Markovian assumption, right, then um, the last state was sufficient to essentially predict what would happen in the future. So we had all the information available to us in that state. And therefore, we could choose an action, or at least optimize our action, um, just based on that state. But now, in the partial observable case, it's more complex because if we only choose actions based on the last observation, and, and these observations, let's say, are, are very noisy or, or very incomplete, right? Let's say they just provide us with a few bits of information as opposed to the entire state, then it's going to be much harder to obtain good actions. And in fact, we might obtain actions that, that are very far from optimal. But then if we condition actions not just on the last observation, but also the previous observations, then it becomes um, perhaps much more informative. But as you can see immediately from the graph, it's also going to be much more complex. right? Because in theory, you see as we go along the process, Right, like here we're just at time step three, and now this action should depend on the previous observation as well as the other one before, the other one before, and so on. And and you know that this, uh, if if the process is very long, this would be intractable. Okay, so this is going to cause some issues. But in any case, from a theoretical perspective, that would be the right thing to do: to condition our actions based on all the previous observations. OK, so here, in any case, um, this model is known as a partially observable Markov decision process. And then you can think of it as just a regular fully observable Markov decision process that's now been augmented with actions. And, and, and now we, we simply condition the actions on those observations. OK, so from a reinforcement learning perspective, now our formal definition of reinforcement learning will also be modified. So we need to introduce the notion of observations. And you'll notice here that what I did is I grayed out okay, uh, the notion of states to indicate that the states are now not observable anymore. But what's observable are the observations. 
Right? So when we first introduced reinforcement learning, we said that we have states, actions, and rewards. And then we assumed that we could have access to the states, that we could observe them. But now we relax this assumption, and instead we just say that we have observations, and that's what's observable. Um, OK, with this, we also have um, a transition model and, 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 a, and a reward model. But then the model needs to be augmented as well with an observation model. So, so basically, the model is also going to be unknown. So that's uh, by definition you know, what happens in reinforcement learning. We, we do not assume that we know the model. But then here, it's a more complex model because and in, in theory, there's also the observation model. So how the observations relate to the hidden state. So there's a distribution for that. And that, too, might be unknown. OK, so given this, so now given just observations, actions, and rewards, perhaps a discount factor and then some horizon, we would like to find the optimal policy that will maximize expected rewards. Right? So, so the objective is the same as, as before. OK, so now um, if we want to go ahead and design some algorithm for the partial observable case, as I explained before, perhaps a simple approach, uh, which is really just a heuristic, is to say, well, let me simplify things. And perhaps I'm going to treat my last observation as a proxy for the last state. OK, so, so here this is an approximation because the observation uh, here we, we assume, or at least yeah, we, we do not assume that it's, it's equal to the state. So it's generally speaking going to be less informative than the state. But still, let's just choose our actions based on the last observation. So when you look at this graph, right, then this, this is uh, obviously okay, a, a bit more complex than, than a fully observable MDP. But it doesn't look so bad because we don't have all these arcs that we saw before. Right? So, so then, um, yeah, this, this will lead to some tractable uh, solutions. OK, so based on this, now what we can do is um, model-based partially observable reinforcement learning. Um, so in the model-based case, what we could do is simply um, learn a hidden Markov model from data. And then after that, start doing our planning um, so optimize a policy that will be based on, on that hidden Markov model. And then so some popular techniques for this uh, would include value iteration and more specifically point-based value iteration techniques. Uh, there's also some policy search techniques. Um, and, and then what has become quite popular in recent years is also to consider Monte Carlo tree search techniques. Um, so yeah, value iteration would typically do some planning with respect to everything, whereas Monte Carlo tree search is, is doing some planning that's partial just given your current state. So it's a lot cheaper in a sense. And then it focuses just on what matters in the short term. So our, pulse, uh, sorry, our, our, our graph is roughly the same as before. So whenever we are doing model-based reinforcement learning, we've got the environment. Then um, here we would um, have, oh, actually, there's a typo here. So this should not be the state. So we would have now reward and observation. OK, so reward and observation that would feed into this. And then here, the model that we would update would be essentially a hidden Markov model. Then after this, we would do some planning. That would lead to either a policy or a value function. And then uh, we would execute an action that would feed back to the environment. Okay? So yeah, so the same picture as before. The difference is that here we will not have a state. So this is a typo again. So this should be an observation. And then our model that we're going to update here is really a hidden Markov model. OK, so let's see now how we can learn a hidden Markov model. Uh, because that's essentially uh, the first step in, into a model-based reinforcement learning technique. So let's see how we can estimate uh, a, a hidden Markov model from data. So, OK, so I've got, again, the picture of a hidden Markov model. So here I've, I've removed the other parts that have to do with uh, the, 
uh, with Markov decision processes or, or reinforcement learning. So I've removed the actions and, and the rewards. But then if we just have the states and, and the observations, then here uh, the parameters would consist of three things. Right? So there's going to be a distribution over initial states. Um, there's also a distribution for the transitions of the states and then a distribution for how the observations are correlated with the states. Okay, so I'm going to denote these parameters by psi, theta, and phi. And um, now we're going to see a simple example where let's say that we have two, two classes for the states and then just two values for the observations. Now, obviously in practice we would have a lot more states than that. Uh, and then the observations could be uh, real numbers, um, so there, there could be like a full range of possible values, not just two values, and you might have a vector of values as well. Okay, so, so in practice it's going to be a lot more complex than this, but for now let me just illustrate um, what happens if we have just two, two states and then two values or two observations. Okay, so um, one simple way of learning a hidden Markov model from data is to apply the maximum likelihood principle. Uh, in other words, we set up an optimization uh, problem where we say, what's the probability uh, that we would observe uh, these observations? And let's say that we've got some labeled data. Let's say that we're in a supervised setting as well, that we observe uh, certain states. And then here we're essentially searching for the parameters that would maximize the probability of, of our data. Okay, so uh, in this approach, um, as usual, what we would do is perhaps um, set the derivative to zero and then simply isolate uh, the parameters. If we can do this in closed form, that's perfect. If we cannot do it in closed form, then what we would do is instead of setting the derivative to zero, you would simply compute the gradient and take a step in the direction of the gradient. Okay, so in any case, with this simple example that, that now I'm going through with just two states and two observations, um, we're going to be able to do this in closed form. And then here, the idea is that we would have some observations that um, would correspond to sequences. So here uh, we might have some sequences of, of states and, and observations, and then we can summarize them uh, with the following statistics. Okay, so here I would like to count how often I was in different classes at the beginning of each sequence. So this will be a count of, of how many times I'm, I'm, I start my process in class CI. And, and then as the process goes on, I'd like to know as well how often I end up in class CI. And then in order to be able to estimate the transition probabilities and the observation probabilities, I'll need to know how often I transition from class CI to class CJ. Uh, actually, no. So here this is the number of times that CI follows CJ. So I go from CJ to CI. And then uh, also how, how often I go, or how often uh, I have value VI in class CJ, okay? So here, um, the idea is that I would have some data, right, that would correspond to sequences where I might have um, for the, the hidden states, let's say C1, C1, C2, C2, C1, C2, 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 C1, etc. Right. So, if let's say with uh, the example of the walker that I gave before, um, I, I record a video sequence, and then there is somebody that essentially watches the video and then simply isolates uh, segments that indicates that a person was, um, let's say, in in uh, doing activity C1, then activity C1, then activity C2, then activity C2, and so on. So this would give us a sequence of activities or a sequence of states. Now, in the same way, um, we also have a sequence of observations that correspond to the sensor measurements. But then for the purpose of this example, just to keep things simple, let's say that the observations, there are just two possible values, V1 and V2. So here we might have 
value v1, 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 v2, v2, v1, v1, v2, v2, and so on. Okay? So, so then we would have a sequence like this, and, and then so this would correspond to, let's say, one run or one trial, and then uh, we would do this multiple times, so we would have multiple sequences like that. Now, with all of those sequences, what I will need in terms of learning the, um, the parameters of my hidden Markov model will be essentially those statistics. Okay, so I'll need to know the number of times that the process starts in class CI. This will help me to estimate my initial distribution over states, psi. I will also need the number of times that I'm, uh, that a process is in class CI, not just at the beginning, but anywhere. And then the number of times that CI follows CJ and the number of times that we have value VI in class CJ. Okay, so with those statistics, then I can estimate the, the parameters of my hidden Markov model as follows. So here we can show that when we do maximum likelihood, so the optimization problem that I mentioned earlier, um, so right here, so uh, maximizing the joint probability of the observations and the states given those uh, parameters. If you write down uh, the uh, optimization, so if you expand this, this distribution and then you, you do the math, uh, you would arrive essentially at some solutions that would correspond exactly to that. Okay, so um, the probability that a process would start in class C1 would essentially be equal to the number of times that we observe some uh, sequences that start in C1 divided by the number of times that they start in C1 as well as C2. So it's essentially just relative frequency counts, which would be like the natural thing that anybody would do whether or not you explicitly maximize likelihood, okay? Uh, we've got the same thing for the transition probabilities and then the observation probabilities. So if we look here at the probability of going from C1 to C1, then this will be the number of times we observe the pair C1, C1, divided by the number of times we've got the pair C1, C1, plus the pair C2, C1. Okay, and then same thing for the observation probabilities. So in this case, it's very simple. I mean, here this is uh, in part because we've got just two values and two states, and then it's discrete, and I mean, this is like the simplest case possible, but it illustrates how you could go about learning those parameters from data. Any questions regarding this? Yeah? The observations, are, so you, you gave the example of accelerometer data, so that's raw sensor information. Do you derive metrics from that as your observations, or are you looking right at the raw values yeah, so, so here we would consider the raw values, but we could also extract some features from that, okay? Um, so, okay, here, in fact, what, what I just described would not even apply to this case uh, with the walker where I've got real values. So this would be more applicable to a case where, let's say, I've got a bit. Let's say that at any point in time I just observe a bit, so there's two values, but then in the case of, of uh, the accelerometers and, and the other sensors for the walker, then, then I would have some real values. Okay, so for that, I need to consider uh, not just multinomial observations, but observations that, that, that can take real numbers. And then one way of doing this would be to consider Gaussian distributions with respect to the observations. Okay, so if I just go back, um, here you see for the observation probabilities, I indicated that, okay, one way of formulating this is to have a conditional distribution. This is uh, typical whenever you've got discrete and finite values for both the states and the observations. But very often, the observations are going to be numerical measures, right? So they're going to be real numbers. And then in that case, uh, it's quite common to use a Gaussian distribution. Now obviously you, you could consider any type of distribution and this is where you have to use your, your domain knowledge and, and decide based on, on the type of values that you observe from your sensors what uh, distribution is appropriate. But then if you use a Gaussian distribution, right, then here we're going to essentially estimate the mean and the variance for the values. And then in this case, 
uh, we would obtain the following solution. Okay, so here uh, for class one, we would estimate the mean, which would correspond precisely to um, the number of times um, that, yeah, so here I, I, I yeah, for, for all the cases where the class was C1, I would simply sum all the observations. The, here the observations are going to be real numbers, and then I would simply divide by the number of times, so that's essentially taking the average. Okay, so this corresponds to the empirical average. And then for, for the variance, uh, it, it's similar, so here we're uh, computing the empirical variance. Uh, so that's essentially the difference between the observed values and the, and the mean squared. And then here we take the average with respect to a half and we are in class one. Yes? Yeah, so, okay, so here I explained this. Um, let me go back. Um, right, so, so here I'm just explaining what if we just have an HMM and, and then so a hidden Markov model and, and, and then I, I remove the notion of actions. But you're absolutely right that here the actions in principle for uh, Markov decision process and reinforcement learning, they're going to influence the states. Right? So we should condition our states and, and even the observations based on, on the actions. Okay? So, so then um, this would change the problem in a way where here instead of just having a simple distribution of st plus 1 given st, it would be a distribution of st plus 1 given st and at. Right? And then same thing for the observation, it would be given st and at as well. Okay, so, so we can condition as well on the actions and then obtain much more precise distributions. Uh, but, but I wanted to keep things simple, so that's why I, I excluded the actions at this point. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Um, all right, so now that we've seen how we can estimate uh, an HMM from data, Let's see how we can now use that and, and do some planning. So the idea is that um, with an HMM, then we can do some belief monitoring. So once I have some parameters, right, then we saw earlier that we can um, uh, do belief monitoring, which will be an estimation of the hidden states given the observations. So, so for belief monitoring, um, if you recall, so there was the forward algorithm, which had a, a, a recursive formula, and then it's essentially computing the probability of st given all the, the observations up until time step t, but that can be written in terms of the distribution of st minus 1 given all the observation up to time step t minus 1. But then, um, yeah, you would also multiply by the transition distribution and the observation distribution. Okay, so, so this is the, the recursive formula that allows us to do the belief monitoring. And, and then, so once we've estimated an HMM, then we're ready to use it to do inference. And then one useful thing to do is to estimate at any point in time what is our belief with respect to, to the hidden state. Okay, so when we do this, now there's something really interesting that happens because now we can um, reformulate a partially observable Markov decision process as a belief MDP. Okay, so before, if I just go back, um, when I introduce, um, yeah, let's go here. So, so this is a, a partially observable Markov decision process, right? And then we said that actions to have as much information as possible should depend on all the previous observations. But then an alternative way of looking at this is that the observations, right, they're, they're, they're correlated with the hidden state. And then in our HMM, we can use monitoring to try to estimate some distribution with respect to the current state. So we don't know what is the state at this time step, but then we have an observation here. There's another observation here. 
And basically, our actions should depend on those two observations. But then those two observations, their purpose is really to inform us about what might be this, this state here. Because if we had this state, then we would be back into a fully observable Markov decision process. And then I could simply choose my action based on that state. But now, if I don't have this state, and I've got observations, maybe I can use those observations instead to try to estimate what is that hidden state. And obviously, I will never know for sure what is the hidden state, but I could estimate a distribution with respect to the hidden state. So that's what I'm showing into the slide later about belief state MDPs. So right here. Yeah, so here you see I'm going to change these nodes instead of just being states, right? Because I can't observe the states. What if I change them to be distributions over states? And now the idea is that those distributions over states, they're going to capture all the information that comes from the previous observations because these beliefs, um, like the belief at time step t, is really the distribution over the state uh, that's based on all the previous observation. So from a statistical perspective, right, we can say that a belief is really a sufficient statistic that captures the same information as the observations because here it's a distribution that conditions on those observations. So, so this is something really interesting because it provides us with a way to use all the previous observations while perhaps having something tractable. Okay, because again, if I just go back to uh, the, the picture for a partially observable Markov decision process, right, then ideally I would condition every action on all the previous observations, but that's uh, intractable, so I'm not going to be able to do this if my process is very long. But then the question then becomes, how can I use as much information as possible from those previous observations? So one answer to this is that we're going to do belief monitoring. Um, so right here, so we're going to do belief monitoring and simply try to estimate what is our belief about the current state given the observations up until that point so that we, we essentially use information from uh, those, ob uh, yeah, we use information from those previous observations. Yeah? Um, I still don't get why the state depends, or the beliefs depends on the previous observations. Seems like it's, a Mar it's Markovian, right? So, so um, the states are, or the probability of the states are independent, but shouldn't the observation be a subset of the information of the state? So shouldn't that also be independent? Okay, very, yeah, very good question. So here, uh, the observations are not um, independent, or at least if we know one observation, then we cannot ignore the other observations. Uh, let me go back to some picture here. Uh, yeah, so this picture is good. Okay, so if I consider this observation O3, right, then you're absolutely right that you see uh, S2 and S1 are nodes that are sort of like in between O3 and O2 or even O3 and any of the previous observations. So here there is a notion of separation. So in fact, um, for process graphical model, we will talk about deseparation. So we, we can separate O3 from the previous observation as long as we know what is the current state. As long as we know S2, or, or even in this case here, as long as we know S1, right? So if we know these states, right, then um, O3 would be independent of the previous observations. But now we're in a partially observable case, so we do not know what is S2, we do not know what is S1, okay? So as a result, what happens is that um, the path is essentially open, and then um, O3 is going to be correlated with O2 as well as, as O1. Uh, but then it, it, not, uh, O3 is not going to subsume necessarily O2 and O1. So O1 and O2 are going to provide potentially additional information that might not be captured by O3. So that's why we still need to 
take into account all the previous observations, at least in, in, w without further assumptions, right, then these might provide some information that, that is not already captured. Yeah? Uh, is it possible that the addition of previous information has a negative effect on all uh, Is it possible that previous information has a negative effect on our decision? So in, in theory, no. So in theory, information is always something good, is always something that um, uh, can help us make better decisions. Now in practice, it depends what algorithm we use to uh, process that information because some algorithms might not be very good and, and then they would use the information in, in the wrong way and then that might lead to a loss in terms of rewards. But otherwise, uh, if, if we consider information in theory, right, then um, additional information never hurts. It can only be helpful in terms of reducing uncertainty and therefore allowing us to make better decisions down the road. Yeah. Um, so, so if O2 o is a part of S, S2, right? Oh, no, no, S1. So like the information of O2 is a part of the information of S1. So given a choice between having S1 or having O2, we would rather to have S1. So, but, but, but O3 is independent of S1. So why, why, why would we want to have O2? So, okay, here you're, you're saying that, yeah, o, o, O3 might be a subset of the information from S2. Same thing, O2 might be a subset of S1. And, and you're absolutely right that O3 is independent of S1 given S2, but if we don't have S2, okay, then, um, then you see if, if I don't have S2, this only gives me a subset of the information about S2, and it's possible that O2 is going to provide me with some of the information that I'm missing here about S2, okay? okay. Wait, wait, so let's say, let's just suppose that in, in one of the states, Instead of observing the observation, we can actually know the state. So will we use the state? Oh, yeah. If, if we can observe the state, then let's use it. And then we don't have to worry about observations or any of that business. Then we're back to a fully observable Markov decision process. I mean, just for one time step. Oh, just for one time step. Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean yes. OK, so if for one time step you happen to know the state, then by all means, again, use it. But, but then at, at the other time steps, then, I mean, you're going to have to potentially use uh, the observations as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what kind of relationship are you trying to model here? Like a correlation relationship or causal relationship? Ah, very good point. Yeah, so are these relationships causal or, or simply cor correlations, right? So I, I guess in, in this course, um, I'm really only talking about correlations. And then correlations are essentially relationships that go both ways. They're symmetric. Okay? Now, in this graph, uh, this is essentially a, a Bayesian network. So we did not uh, talk about this uh, at all, in fact. Uh, but but um, really, I'm, I'm displaying the hidden Markov model using the notation of a Bayesian network. And the idea is that these arcs essentially indicates that there's a probability of one variable given another one. So it's simply because when I express my correlations, I'm going to do this through conditional distributions. And then the conditional distributions are always a variable given another one. And then the arc tells us which variable the conditional distribution is about and which one is the parent or the evidence. Okay? But now there's also the question of is there some sort of ca causality or causation going on here. And it, it, it turns out that for Bayesian networks, it's often easier to think about them whenever we can draw the arcs to correspond to a, a, a causal relationship. Okay? And, and in fact, if we have a process that evolves over time, it's clear that causality has to go with time as well. It cannot go backward in time. So, uh, so it's really just S0 that can influence S1. And, and not the other way around. Uh, but, but at least um, for the purpose of this course, 
we're not going to worry about uh, notions of causality. And, and here, these arcs simply indicate conditional distributions. That's all. And just correlation. And correlation, yeah. So yeah, we're, we're just indicating that there's correlation. And, and really here, if an arc goes in one direction, it still means that there's a correlation in both ways. Okay, so, so again, the arc does not mean that there's a causal relationship here or that there's any notion of direction per se. It just indicates that when I write a conditional distribution, I, I typically have some variables on the left-hand side of, of the vertical bar and some variables on the right-hand side, and that corresponds to that, okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so let's come back to this picture. So, so now what I've expressed is this idea that I can formulate um, something that is equivalent to a partial observable Markov decision process where now instead of conditioning my actions on previous observations, which would require conditioning on all previous observations if I wanted to use as much information as possible, then instead I can condition on the belief that I compute at the previous step. Because that belief, as we saw uh, here, right, it's a sufficient statistic that captures the information of all previous observations, and then I just have to update that belief each time I see a new observation using this equation. So that's, that's the beauty of, of this formulation. So once we have a belief MDP, now, this is very similar to a regular fully observable Markov decision process. The only difference is that now my notion of state is not a, a, a value or a vector per se. It, it's going to be a distribution. Well, I, I guess I can always represent the distribution by its parameters, which, which might fit into a vector. But, but in any case, the point is that here I, I need to think about this as really a distribution. And then given that distribution, now I can select actions. And then otherwise, everything else is the same as before. And, and this would correspond to a regular Markov decision process. OK, so based on this, now we can formulate a simple value iteration technique that could work with the belief MDP. And what I'm doing is essentially uh, changing states for beliefs in this formulation, right? So if you recall, when we talked about Bellman's equation, right? So we have the optimal value for a state that's going to be equal to the max over actions uh, for the, the immediate reward plus uh, an expectation of future rewards. And then everything in here for the, uh, the, the, the traditional value iteration algorithm would depend on states. But now I'm going to replace states by beliefs, and, and then this will work in the same way. So, so this is, a, you see, a, a way to allow us to still capture all information from previous observations. Um, and, and then so at every step, you see there's going to be a corresponding belief for the current state. And then I will update that belief. So here, BAO prime right, simply indicates that this is the belief at the next time step that's been updated based on choosing a certain action and executing, uh, sorry, executing a certain action and then observing the next observation. OK, so, so this is um, yeah, essentially the same algorithm that we saw at the beginning of the course, uh, good old value iteration. But now I've replaced s by b. And then that means, for instance, that whenever I talk about the reward in terms of a belief, I can expand that to be just an expectation of the rewards with respect to my belief. Okay? And then in the same way, when I talk about the observation distribution here, um, it depends on a belief. So I can expand that to be equal to um, an expectation with respect to S prime as well as S of the observation distribution times the transition distribution times the, the belief. And then to compute my updated belief, which, which goes into the value function at, at the next step, right? then I would simply um, uh, apply 
um, the belief monitoring equation to compute the probability of S prime given B, A, and O prime, which is uh, really just equal to this expression. Yeah? Uh, here, because we have added action, uh, shouldn't we condition a belief on previous actions as well? That's right. So yeah, so here, um, yeah, I'm, I'm using an, an equation to update beliefs that's based on uh, actions not just observations, because in practice, what will happen is uh, you see the, the transition model depends not just on the current state, but also the action. And then same thing for the observation model, it will depend on, on actions. Okay, so, so now I'm introducing actions. So here you see I, it's, 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 it's really the same as the HMM that I explained before, with the same belief monitoring update, but condition on actions as well. Oh, in previous slides. Uh, let's go back. Yes. Yeah, so here, yeah, you're right. That here, what I would want to do is also condition on actions. Um, I did not write this here because I just wanted to keep the notation simple. But, but then now you can see, like if you compare these two equations, right, to the equation that I have in the algorithm, right, it's, it's, it's really the same thing. It's just that now I condition on actions as well. Okay, so now you see, we, when, when we talked about uh, Bayesian reinforcement learning, we also use a notion of a belief state, right? So in that case, it was a distribution with respect to the unknown parameters. Here it's a distribution with respect to the unknown <coughs> state. So this notion of belief is quite common, right? And then it's no surprise here that I'm, I'm using the same terminology. I'm using the notion of belief. And then in both cases, for partial observability or otherwise whenever we're trying to do Bayesian reinforcement learning and then we, we have unknown parameters, right, then we can have a distribution over those unknowns. Here it's a distribution over the state. Before it was a distribution over the parameters, but it leads to similar concepts, okay? And it's often referred in both cases to some type of belief MDP. Yes, so we need to update the belief during the iteration. So here, I wanted to write the algorithm in essentially the same way as we saw it at the beginning of the course, right, where we just have one equation. But if you look carefully in that equation, right, I've got here B A O prime. What that means is that now I'm taking the updated belief, and that's why I wrote this equation here below, where my belief is updated according to this equation. So I guess to be more explicit, what I might want to do is essentially put this equation right above here to show that, okay, in practice, to, I, I would have first a step where I update the belief, and then there would be after that a step where I, I do the, the Bellman backup, where I use my updated belief.